Hello everybody, welcome to Elite Wine TV. I'm Hello everybody, welcome to Elite Wine TV. Elite Wine TV. I'm your host Mark Fusco here with another, another episode of the show, and I've got Gary Elliott here with uh, Driftwood uh, Estate uh, Vineyards, mm -hmm. and uh, he's been winery. Sorry, <laughs> Driftwood Estate Winery. Um, uh, I have a link. I have a link to the uh, website uh, down below. Um, he's been very kind to uh, give me a quick little tour, and uh, we're gonna do a quick little tasting here. He's got a group in the background. You might hear some noise going on. He's got a group that just showed up. Um, and uh, we're going to taste a couple wines. Um, first of all, I'd like to get a little history and get a little introduction about who you are and, and how you started all this. And well, um, came from California originally. Okay. Family is uh, in the wine business out there in Paso Robles, Central California coastal area. And uh, in 1998, I planted the vineyard. At that time, uh, we couldn't sell wine here because it was a dry area. Right. So I sold grapes to some of the other wineries in the local area for a couple of years. And then 2001, we changed the law. And 2002, uh, I applied for and got my winery license. There were only about 35 wineries in Texas at that time. Uh, and so the, we'll be going into our 10th anniversary uh, for the winery next year. Awesome. That, that's really cool. I mean, uh, if you have a chance to come out here, you need to because I know it's a kind of a dreary day. Uh, I don't know if you can tell, but it's not too bright outside. It's kind of rainy, but that's good it's right now. Very good for the vineyard. Um, but it's an amazing view. Um, I got some pictures of the wine. I'll get some pictures of, of the view in a little bit. And we'll put that up on, we'll, I'll insert that in here and put on the wine on the website. Um, but we were talking about that, you know, how in the past few years, this time of year has not been really good for rain. Uh, well, so kind of describe yeah. why that's good right now. Well, we've had dry winters for the last four or five years, and it's taken its toll uh, because the root systems for the grapevines develop in the winter when the vines are dormant, and without that rainfall, uh, we get little or no new root development, and, and that makes the, uh, the vines less healthy each year. Uh, it looks so far, it looks like we're going to get some nice, consistent rainfall uh, periodically this winter if this pattern continues. And, okay. and that'll be probably the best uh, winter root development that, that we've seen over the last five years. Good, good. That's, that's good, to, it's good to know. Um, anyway, I was just thinking about this when I, I gone up to um, uh, Fall Creek and, and talk with Ed Aller. He's a pilot too. You're your pilot. I was a pilot eight years as a commercial pilot. And, and he, he talked about the weather patterns and there's a big circulation that starts out over well, I guess Bermuda. And this is kind of like is this kind of like a Well, our rainfall is actually influenced by the Pacific Ocean, whether whether it's a La Nina or an El Nino. Right. In a La Nina year we get uh, less rainfall and in an El Nino year we get more rainfall. Uh, kind of the Pineapple Express they call it where the storms come in from the Pacific and they come right up through the southern right. part of the country. Uh, because we've been under an El, a, a La Nina, all the rainfall has been going up over us and, and back down on the east coast and they're right. missing us. We've been a dry pocket down here in Texas. But uh, what we're getting now is we're still under the wrong kind of current. Uh, it's still a lot in you, but we're getting some low pressures that are dropping down from uh, Northern California area, and okay. those are drawing up some Gulf moisture. And what we're getting now is rainfall from the Gulf moisture. But if we really want to get into a wet pattern, we need an El Nino. Okay. And that'll bring all these specific storms in through Texas rather than up over Texas. Okay. So yeah, I mean, being a pilot, you have, I know that you have to like really pay attention to the weather and you know, yeah. know all those weather patterns. Oh yeah. You know, I, I just kind of go El Nino, and I, you know, because for for I guess people like me, we don't well, which one is, and we don't know the difference. So it's good to, to get the difference on that. I mean, we hear it occasionally, and you know, the weather the weather guy will tell us you know what's going on. But 
I know you have you have to pay attention to that. Oh yeah. Well, okay. I mean, just as being a farmer, but being, being a pilot. A, yeah, being in agriculture, it's the same thing. Right. You kind of live on the on the weather channel, and when I was flying, it was the same thing. Right. We also live on the weather channel. So you know, whether it's whether show you're your senior VFR stuff. You know, they, they, I remember growing up, they, they actually they actually did talk about VFR, and I was like, what's that? I don't know. Visual flight. Yeah, <laughs> you know. Most of my flying was in storms and rainstorms right. and stuff storms. And all, <laughs> all kinds of bad weather. I spent right. a year flying an air ambulance, and of course, we were going, we'd be going out in the middle of the morning, 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning, and it'd be terrible weather. But we had to get patients to a critical right. care center, you know, it's a life or death situation. Right, exactly. All right, cool. Um, so let's uh, let's get into let's get into some wine here now. What what do we have here today? This uh, first one you're tasting is our new Cuvée Blanc that we just bottled, 2011 grapes, all out of our vineyard. Okay. So it's an estate bottle wine, and it's a field blend, which means I literally picked all the grapes at the same time, put them all in the tank together. We didn't make separate wines and blend the wines together. We literally blended the grapes together. And this is a, a blend of uh, Chardonnay, Chenin Blanc, Viognier, and Muscat Blanc. Okay. All four of our white grapes. All right. Very nice. And it just bottled yesterday, so it's still a little bottle shocked. Uh, it'll, the, the fruit flavors and aromas will get stronger as the, as the wine recovers from being pushed through a sterile filter yesterday. Okay. So, I mean, first of all, this is really cool because I, I, I don't, I've never had anything like right off the bottle. I've had some barrel samples before. Um, never had anything directly out of, after bottling. I guess the closest I've had was a, a Rusco and Beaujolais, the Nouveau. That's about the closest yeah. we get to, to, to freshly bottled. This, this, this particular bottle was the last one off the line, which was uh, at about 5 o'clock last night. Okay. And you did about 500 and... We did 126 cases of okay. the Cuvée Blanc, and we did about a little over 400 cases of the Muscat Canel. And it, it's very fruity. It even, it even has kind of like a, um, a... I don't want to use the word sprite necessarily, but, but there's like a kind of an effervescent there, type of quality to it. Effervescence, uh, it'll, that'll tone down a little bit. That's because there's still there was a lot of CO2 in the wine when we bottled it, okay. and if you watch the bottles going to the bottling line, you can see all the bubbles almost look like champagne. Right. But that 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 goes away after a while after the after it's been sitting in the bottle for a while. But it it, it is nice. Uh, a lot of people like that. It's a real spritzy fresh. Right. Yeah. It has, definitely has a, a spritzer type of of, of uh, smell to it, and it's a very. Uh, Acidic wine. It's got very nice acidity to it. Okay, how are you? Yeah, I mean it's it's. I mean fresh. I guess is the. I mean it would be fresh. Just fresh wine, but it does have that fresh quality to it. I mean, it's uh, it's something that yeah I can see. Let it sit in the bottle for a little bit. Let it settle down. Yeah. Uh, chill a little bit. Um, definitely lots of acid to it. Um, I get the acid more, um, not not initially. It comes up a little bit, but my mouth is watering, and that's another indication that you've got a lot of acid going on. Because you get that saliva going, and, and it makes you want to drink more or have something to eat with it. You know, so tons of acid on there. Um, again, it's real young, so it's it's kind of all over. But that's fine because you know you, it's going to develop a little more. Oh yeah, and uh, you'll get a little more structure to that, a little more focus on on, on the acid. I love the nose. It's it's very fruity. Uh, you've got that. You've got you know, like I said, you've got that spritzer type of thing. Yeah, it's got some Viognier and some Muscat, and that's going to give it a real aroma, it's real strong aromas. And I, and I found that you know on the red wine side, on, on reds. For me, Cabernet Franc is becoming like the, 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 the new favorite for me. Um, but Viognier uh, is, is on the white side is something that I'm really gravitating towards. I don't talk a whole lot about it because I the, the past few months I've been doing more red than white just because well, I've gone to France and almost, almost everything I had was there red. But um, uh, on, on the white side, Viognier is one of those grapes that I'm really gravitating towards. I really like the, the profile that it has. Yeah, that's kind of our flagship 
white wine. We've had a little trouble harvesting it lately. Uh, I've planted new acreage of it, so when those new acres come online, we'll be we'll be producing a lot more of it again. Uh, in 2002, my first uh, bottling of the Viognier was written up in the Wine Spectator, mm. which was amazing at that time to even be recognized by that magazine. And then in 2005, I won all championship belt buckles at the Houston Livestock Show with my Viognier. Nice. And Viognier, the, the, you feel that's a really good, uh, obviously you, you feel it's a really good grape for Texas in general? Oh, well, uh, it does, it's, it's a Rome varietal. It's used to warm weather, it does well in a warm climate. Right. So it does extremely well here in the Hill Country. But even up in Lubbock, where they have cooler nights and it's more of a colder region, uh, they do very well up there as well. It's I think it's just a very versatile grape, um, but it, uh, it I think it's one of the grapes that's going has been doing very well in, in Texas and it will continue to do very well. And it seems like you know, in, in people that I've talked to, other other uh, winemakers in Texas and just in general, other bloggers in Texas and just the, the whole Texas scene. That is seems to be uh, one of the grapes that, that is doing well, and it's kind of like a grape that, that we should focus on. Yeah, uh, oh yeah, definitely. You know, I know, I know. Over the past, you know, 10, 15 years, as, as more, more and more people are getting into the business, you know, everyone's trying to figure out what what does well. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, whether it's France has had centuries, right, uh, <laughs> years to figure it out, and California's had uh, you know a lot of years to figure it out, uh, and they're still. You know, they're still finding new things and, and right. trying new things. But yeah, we uh, we're just at the beginning of like, finding out what what works well here. Right. But we also have a lot of different climates. If it doesn't work well here in the hill country, it'll work well up in Lubbock. If it or if it doesn't work well up there, maybe it'll work well down here. So we're not confined to one tiny climat climatic right. condition. Uh, everybody says, well, uh, what grapes grow well in Texas? And I always say, well, what Depends on what part of Texas you're talking about. That's like saying what grapes grow well in Washington, Oregon, California. Right, and that's something to you know. I think living in Texas, growing up in Texas, you're you're used to the enormous the enormity of Texas and you know, the the whole you know everything's bigger in Texas. You know, they're, they're, you can fit countries inside this state. Oh, yeah. You know, and, and when people think, I mean, like, California's long, so that's there, there's there's that you've got a, a huge north south thing going on, but you know, you you don't have people that live in states like Illinois and New York and New Jersey, where I was born. Um, you know, that you, you can't. It's hard to wrap your head around how big the state is because to them, especially in like smaller states, if it's cold in one part of the state, it's going to be cold in the other part of the state. If it's raining, it's going to be raining the entire state. Where here, you know, even even going from San Antonio to Austin, it's only it's only seventy miles. There there's there can be completely different climates. I mean, it's going to be more likely to snow up in this Austin area than it will in San Antonio, where it snows like once every couple of decades, you know? <laughs> when you drive from here to California, it's a two-day drive. Right. The first day is pretty much entirely in Texas, and the second day is New Mexico, Arizona, and California. Right. You know, we used to take family trips to Florida, and I mean, it's only about five hours to get out of Texas from San Antonio. So Texas, you know, the first day is Texas, Louisiana, because you got a little bit. Louisiana's kind of wide down in the South Park, and then the rest it's like Mississippi, Alabama's like you blink, you miss, bang, bang, bang. and then you got all oh, of Florida to get down to the. But you know, it's like yeah, half your trip is is Texas, Louisiana, then you then you blink, yeah. you got through Alabama, Mississippi, like what happened? Yeah, no matter where you're going. The Half the trip is just getting out of the state of Texas. Yeah, <laughs> especially if you live in the Central Park. So, um, so yeah. I mean, I really like the you know the, the lemon lime and, and even like uh, the cantaloupe type of, of flavors. And, and after this wine sits in the bottle or settles for a couple of weeks, it probably will take more than a few days or a week right. at the most. Then the aromas will get stronger. The uh, flavors will get stronger, and that'll that'll balance out some of that acidity as the flavors come back because what happens when you bottle, everybody calls it bottle shock, but it's actually filter shock. Okay. What you're doing is you're pushing the wine through a half of a micron sterile filter and when you push it through that filter it kind of breaks up the little molecular chains, it changes the chemistry slightly and then it takes a while 
before those molecules reform and go back to where they were. Okay. Okay. It's sort of like you know, it's sort of like you mess it up and then you let it sit for a while and it goes back to where it was. And when when the, when all of the chemistry goes back to where it was, then the flavors and the aromas pop back up again. Uh, I tasted this for a couple of other wine winery owners yesterday before we uh, bottled it and right. and it. Big, big flavors, big aromas, and the minute we got it in the bottle, then of course it it tones down the flavors and aromas, and that allows the acidity to really pop up, kind of smack you in the mouth right. a little bit. But that's all going to go back to you know, like I said, in a, in a few days or a week, it'll all go back to where it was. Awesome. That's simply something I need to do sometime in the future is to be there like for a bottle so I can taste it before and after you yeah get, you get that type of experience yeah that's where you experience what what the bottling does to the wine but it's only a temporary thing right it's kind of like the movie bottle shock right, right yeah where it turns brown and right brown. yeah <laughs> uh, I don't know that that could ever really happen but but it's the same idea same idea right right exactly cool very cool this one you'll you'll like this okay this one has such powerful aromas that even the bottling didn't didn't knock them down too much, but and, and again, this will get this will get better as it sits too. But you can you can really really smell that muscat aroma. And this is just the muscat. Yeah, hundred percent muscat canelli. And these grapes came from the uh, Russell Leopard Vineyard up near Plains Brownfield. Uh, we har harvested them up there, and then uh, I took the grapes over to uh, another winery real close by and we crushed it okay. and then we froze the juice down to about 30 degrees and th if this was in the summer when it was 110 degrees out right <laughs> so it was, I couldn't transport the grapes uh, and then I took I have a couple of insulated uh, tanks 600 gallon tanks and I put them on the back of the trailer they're old milk tanks and I went up with those we put this 30 degree grape juice muscat grape juice in those tanks and drove all the way back it, it was up in Homestead almost in Oklahoma right I drove all the way back down here through 110 degree heat and it had only warmed it had only warmed up to about 35 degrees it was still oh, man. yeah kept it real cold because I didn't want it to start fermenting on the natural yeast from the grapes got it and uh, then we I pumped it into our tank here uh, inoculated it with the yeast and and all the other uh, stuff that we put in, and then uh, we got it going. And the thing I did on this, a lot of people will ferment the the muscat full dry. They just let it go and ferment right. its way out, and they'll add back whatever amount of sugar they want to to get the sweetness. Okay. And I stopped the fermentation so that instead of having sucrose or, or cane sugar as a sweetener, it has the natural fructose, uh, nice. natural grape sugar in it nothing else and it's it's a real it's like shooting a moving target trying to stop it where you want because because when you start to chill the tank down uh, it still wants to keep fermenting and so what I had to do was gradually crank the temperature down to slow the fermentation process and I was up all night checking it uh, every few hours and and then as it would get closer to my target which is two to two and a half percent residual sugar I kept increasing the coal and and so I'm bringing the temperature down while it's fermenting and I have to get to the point where the temperature gets to the point where it stops the fermentation and it stops it right where I want it not right. too soon and not too late right you know and, and um, uh, a couple of things I want to want to talk about so you talked about the natural yeast so did you use the yeast that was that was already with the grapes no no okay no we, we use uh, we use regular uh, commercial yeast and okay the yeast that I used on both of these wines is a new yeast that just came out and it uh, it's been designed uh, to prevent h2s from forming which okay. is a sulfur compound and uh, if you're not careful in, in the production of white wines uh, you don't put enough nutrition in uh, you can develop that H2S. But this new yeast eliminates that, also brings out a lot of nice flavors that I like, uh, including pineapple and things like that. Yeah, definitely. And another thing, you know, we kind of touched upon the whole ro the romantic idea of owning a winery. You're up all night. You know, this is not, this is not, you know, Oh, just put some yeast in there, and then it'll ferment, and then it'll, you know. Yeah. Oh <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, no, it's it's not. The, not, the not wine doesn't. Easy. The wine doesn't doesn't have a schedule. You've got to, you've <laughs> got to control your temperature, and I haven't got the temperature controllers on my tanks yet. That's another 
expensive item right. on, on my on my want list or wish right. list. But so I have to turn manually turn the chiller on and off uh, to control the temperature so it doesn't get too hot, doesn't get too cold. And uh, eventually I'll get the controllers and that'll allow me to sleep a little more at night when I'm fermenting wines. But, right. uh, but on this particular one, I had to really keep an eye on, on the bricks and had to check the bricks level uh, continuously to see how fast it was fermenting. And then I kind of, when I could see how fast it was fermenting, that told me how fast I had to chill it down. Okay. Because, you know, if you, you stop it too soon, it's going to be too sweet. If you don't stop it in time, it's going to go dry on you. Okay. Um, what, what temperature range are you looking at where, where you're doing all this? Well, initially, the uh, the white wines I like to ferment at about 60, 65 degrees. The lower part of the uh, of the working range of the yeast. The yeast will work okay. between a certain high and a certain low. And, uh, you know, 60, 65, I try to keep it down there. You can even get down to 55 with some yeasts. Um, and that way you don't cook off the, 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 the aromas. Okay. Now with the red wines, you want a little hotter fermentation temperature so you can get better extraction from the skins. Okay. Get more out of the fruit. But I like to ferment the white wines at a much cooler temperature. And then as I started getting closer to my target, I'd get the temperature down into the 40s, and of course it would still be fermenting slowly, and then the temperature kept going down, and, and it, as it slowed, I slowed the reduction in the temperature, and and so it, it got to the point where it was just barely fermenting, and I kind of left it there until it got right about where I wanted it, and then I just iced up the outside of the tank and brought it right down to 30 degrees, okay. 28 degrees actually. And, that's, and that stops the fermentation. And then, so you, you keep it that way for, for how long? Oh, for it stayed long? there, it stayed there, yeah. and, uh, Well, we had a filter. Uh, we had a lot of filtration to do on, on the muscat because the muscat grape has a lot of pulp in it, has a lot of meat to the to the fruit. Okay. And so you get uh, a lot of what we call um, solids and those solids plug your filters up, the filter pads up. So it was very difficult getting it through the pads and getting the filter down to where we could uh, manage it. But we basically kept it cold the entire time because we didn't want the fermentation to restart. Right. And uh, and then after we had it filtered down to where it was pretty clear, we kept it at 28 degrees for about two months. And that cold stabilizes it. Uh, so that takes care of our cold stabilization process. Okay. Then, uh, then we did a last final pad filtering just the day before bottling, and that brought it down to about 0.45 microns an hour. Then uh, on the bottling line, we go through a, a sterile filter, okay. a nice sterile filter. That gets rid of all the yeast, so you don't ever have to worry about uh, restarting fermentation in the bottle. You don't want it to start fermenting again. Right, of course, bottling. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, and, it, and it gets rid of all your bacteria, you don't, you don't have any bacteria problems. Okay. Yeah, if you don't sterile filter a white wine, then you have to sorbate it. You put in uh, sorbate, to, uh, which is a chemical that kills yeast, and then that, that prevents the development of fermentation. Okay. But, uh, red wines are different. Um, uh, most people will sterile filter the white wines. A lot of people don't sterile filter the red wines because they think it's going to remove color and, and flavors and things, but that's okay. that's a fallacy, that's not true. All of your all your chemical compounds that, that create color and flavors are so small that they'll pass through a sterile filter. But the larger compounds, which are spoilage bacteria and yeasts and things like that, they will be stopped by the uh, sterile filter. Okay. Cool, and this is stuff that I don't really talk about very much. This is why I like to come out and talk to talk to the winemakers and talk to talk to people that, that do this because this is a learning experience for me. I don't know everything. No one can know everything about wine, but I, I learn more and more every time I come visit. That's why I like to do these visits. Um, I didn't know about all that type of stuff before. You know, yeah. no, and, it's all chemistry. Wine chemistry, right? the most important part of winemaking is the chemistry and, and cleanliness, just being uh, clean. Right. Because if you don't keep everything sterile and clean, you're going to you're gonna have bacteria growth. And it's right. spoilage bacteria that ruins most wines. And you can't eat a wine and it really tastes bad or off. It's a, it's a spoilage bacteria that was allowed to, to get out of control. So you've got to have extremely 
good uh, sterile uh, hygiene in the winery. Um, it's got to be clean. And the other thing is the chemistry. You've got to keep your balance, keep your pHs correct, and, and do all the things that are necessary to keep the chemistry uh, from doing things. Because when, when the chemistry in the wine starts to change on you, it can change for the good or it can change for the bad. Right. And uh, if you get the wrong chemistry changes in your wines, then they can, they can turn bad. And that's something I've noticed, you know, in, in all the, the touring I've done, whether it's Texas or in France, um, the cleanliness of, of, yeah. of everything. And even a couple, I've been to a couple of breweries and they, they, they do the same thing. They have to, they have to be clean there too. And just knowing that, you know, any type of spoilers, it, it yeah. costs you lots of money. And it's not any kind of bacteria that's harmful. Right. You know, it's not like the food processing plant where if they're not clean, you're going to get salmonella or right. E. coli. And, and because we're dealing with an al an alcohol, uh, those types of harmful bacteria can't exist. So we're not worried about hurting someone, poisoning them, or killing them. But, we're, but we have to worry about a spoilage bacteria, right. which although it's not harmful to humans, it, it's harmful to the wine. Right, and, and then it becomes unsellable. It's an economic right. yeah. Yeah, it's different than, you know, in my, my day job in restaurants where you have to be clean so you don't kill anybody. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and you don't want the food to taste bad, but you don't want to, you don't want to harm anyone, make them get sick. Yeah. Um, and in, 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 the, in the restaurants, they use bleach a lot. Yes. That's the number one bacteria killer, but we can't use it in the wineries because it'll destroy the wine. taste, right? Well, no, it'll destroy the wine. Yeah. Uh, TCA, trichloroanosyl bacteria, right. uh, can be created by bleach. Uh, and there's other... other uh, what happens is the, the bleach just literally destroys the wine. If you took a whole tank of wine and you just drop a tiny little bit of bleach into it, it that wine's gone. Oh, so man. Destroy it. So yeah, we can't use bleach. Even even if you clean, well, if you clean with bleach, you've got to make sure that 100% of that bleach is gone before you get it in contact with the wine. And it's just very risky to do. It's it's just too risky. So you'll find that most wineries won't have bleach anywhere near the winery. Got it. Yeah, I wouldn't want to risk it at all. <laughs> we have, you know, we have other acids and other compounds that we clean right. with. We sanitize uh, uh, paracetic acid. Uh, there, there, there's several others that, that are very good cleaners. Uh, they work almost as well as bleach does, and, and their safety is more important. Right. Very right, cool. I really like that. I really like that Muscat Canelli. Um, it's got a nice little sweetness to it. It's not overly sweet. Um, it's got some more of the tropical, more of the tropical uh, fruit flavors rather than the really citrusy stuff. Uh, but it, it, it's, it also has a bit of that spritz, you yeah. know, it's yeah, got the, the CO2, CO2 from a fresh new, right. new bottle. Yeah. So um, but it's got that, it's, nice, it's fresh, but I definitely like that little bit of sweetness. Like I said, it's not overly sweet. You're not like, oh man, it's too sweet. Not a dessert wine. No, it's not. It's not a dessert wine. It's something you can easily just, you know, Actually, easily drink. It pairs very well with spicy Asian food. Absolutely. I mean, it's ideal for that, and, and uh, or any kind of spicy food. Spicy appetizers, it's great. Or you can drink it as an aperitif before, or uh, right. drink it before a meal. Uh, un unlike a dessert with muscat or dessert wine that's six to eight percent residual sugar, this one's only about two, two and a half percent. Right. And that's, that's a very key point to talk about because, you know, Moscato wines, the really sweet wines, they're, 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 the, they're the trend, they're the trendy thing. Um, and restaurants like to put them on their menus and I look at that and go, what did you pair it with? Because you just put it there because everyone's raving about it. Um, they, uh, they're, they're, they're a lot sweeter um, rather than what this is, you know, and, and it's not, it's, the pairing is a little different, you know. And, yeah, the only the, the reason I leave that little bit of sweetness is because if you take a muscat wine completely dry, you're gonna have a bitter bitterness there. It's just, right. it's a, it, unlike other white wines that you can go completely totally dry, like a Chardonnay or a Viognier. Uh, the muscat grape, if you go totally dry, it's it's just got a bitterness to it. You have to have a little bit of residual sugar, at least a percent or two, to carry the fruit flavors okay. and, and keep it up, really keep it nice. And and, uh, and we're talking about that pairing. I mean, having having a wine with with just that little bit of sweetness. Again, it doesn't have to be sugar. It doesn't have to be really really sweet like a dessert wine sweet. It really helps with a lot of Asian fare or just anything that's spicy. Anything that has a lot of you know, spiciness to it. Um, it really cuts into it. You wouldn't think that you know. A lot of people don't think that, that sweet wine necessarily is something you you want to. 
Well, with that, but well, man, anytime I've, right. I've gone to especially like Asian restaurants and they and I love spicy food in general, but just have the spices with, with Asian food. Um, I'm looking for the sweeter wines, yeah, because it helps cut that heat, you know. Those exactly, I love it. Awesome. Uh, well, this has been a wonderful experience, um, Gary. I really appreciate uh, you taking the time. Uh, give me a little tour, uh, getting to see the winery, the barrels. I got, like I said, I got some pictures of all that. Uh, take some more pictures of the facility so we can, I can show off. Uh, the rain seems to have tapered off a little bit. Get some nice pictures of, of, of the property. Um, and it's, it's been wonderful. Uh, you know, it's, it's a great, you know, I, I love coming in and, and having these things because it, one, it's, you know, it's, it's, a, it's an education for me because I get to see, you know, yes, have I seen tanks before? Yes, I've seen tanks before. Yes, I've seen barrels before. But, you know, I, it, it's it's still to me it's an experience to see it in in the situation and and uh, being able to talk with talk with the winemakers and, and learn more about what's going on. You know, so it's it's wonderful experience. Really appreciate it. Thank you very much. I know you're busy today. Got a lot of stuff to do. And uh, appreciate all the time you gave me. Okay. Awesome. Thank you, right. folks. That's going to do it for today. Um, we'll see everybody again next time. Uh, we got more wine coming, and uh, that's going to be it. Thanks a lot.